Today, reading the economic tea leaves. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I want to go through some of the things that I've been thinking about with regard to the old thorny question of inflation or deflation and touch on a few of the issues that I think should be on the table. Now, I have to tell you that this post is not necessarily going to end with a definitive position, but I want to underscore some of the critical questions that I'm thinking about at the moment and that you might want to think about too. There are lots of different models out there for how the economy works, right? And I guess the neoliberal view is that the economy is fundamentally powered by debt and uh, the more debt we can push into the system, that inflates asset prices, that creates greater GDP activity, and um, that has what's been happening for the last 20 to 30 years in particular, right? And so, uh, you know, the the, the, the theory goes, well, you basically um, take uh, deposits, those deposits get lent on, that creates momentum in the market, though that can then be lent out, etc. That's the classic model. Now, in fact, that's wrong on a few perspectives in my view, but the most critical one is that actually lending comes first. So essentially, if you look carefully, what's happened is that lending has created pretty much all of the growth, economically speaking, around the world. And banks can continue to, can continue, can, can continue to write as much lending as there is demand for lending to be had right so so that's sort of the, the the basic philosophy and basically that what that says is for as long as credit growth continues to rise that will then lead to more gdp more economic activity and therefore overall growth now that is if you like the classic model that's the one that uh, most people in the mainstream would probably hold to and therefore the way to actually get more growth is to reduce interest rates so that it makes it easier and more attractive for people to to basically borrow and that can be people can be businesses as well as individuals and corporates um, so you drag rates down that creates more momentum and that will then create more activity and that will lift gdp so that's that's the the, the fundamental economic now of course you get to the point where you can take rates down so far and then essentially you get to the point where you have to take them into negative territory if you want to continue that trajectory because we are close to zero, right? So the economic growth that we've had over the last 30 years in Australia is fundamentally about taking rates lower, driving more debt, and that's why particularly household debt is um, way higher than it was. So that's the classic, that's the classic model. Now, in that environment, what it basically says is, okay, if you then start creating ever more liquidity in the marketplace, and that liquidity can come simply from uh, banks writing more credit, or it can come from the concept of uh, essentially the central banks then starting to, you know, just create more money. That's the old money printing QE thing, right? Put that money into the system, that then produces more activity. The risk is that activity ultimately then starts to devalue the value of money. And the risk then is that you have to try and tackle two issues off the back of that. The first issue is you could end up <clears throat> with effectively international investors losing faith and trust in the Australian economy, which means that they will be less willing to invest unless you start increasing rates again. Right? And the second is that in the sort of the fiat theory of money, you devalue the value of money. So effectively, the numbers get bigger, but the value doesn't necessarily go up. And that's where you get the inflation theory. So basically, what it says is if you continue to flood money into the system and more and more money of that, uh, of that money is lent, um, that creates more activity, sure, but then you risk inflation. And of course, that was the model that was happening in the 70s when, of course, we had the oil shock and we had high interest rates. So that's the sort of the theory. So, so most people, I think, in the mainstream would say, right, in that environment, what you do is you protect yourself with assets that don't get inflated away like 
precious metals or uh, other things like that, right? And and so therefore gold becomes a hedge and uh, many of the larger uh, players, I mean Radiallo is a good example, right, basically is an advocate of gold. And even, um, you know, um, Warren Buffett has actually invested in gold, or not directly in gold, he's actually in Investing gold miners, so so that's the sort of the, the classic view, and there are many people out there who believe that the future is inflationary. So that's where you start the conversation. But my view is, I'm not sure that that's necessarily that convincing, right? Because we have had lower interest rates than we've ever had, and if you look at the economies around the world that have actually followed this track. And I'm thinking here of Japan, who's been at it for you know 20 odd, 30 odd years now, or the Eurozone, they've taken rates lower. And in fact, the exact opposite is happening. So rather than inflationary effects coming through, we're starting to see deflationary effects. In other words, we should be clear about definitions here. What is deflation? So you can define deflation or inflation looking at CPI. Well, CPI probably gives you a bit of a myopic view of what's going on. You can look at it in terms of um, money supply. And there are people who hold that uh, the way to define inflation is purely growth in money supply. Well, the money supply in Australia grew 11% over the last year. In the US, it's more than 20%. But that doesn't necessarily, in my view, lead to um, you know re real inflation, all the things I've just been talking about. And in fact, the, the, the alternative theory is as you take interest rates down, there is a limit to the impact that that actually has. And if you don't get demand for more lending to come through, then essentially you have the start of an issue because you get deflation rather than inflation more likely to happen. And if you actually have people repaying debt rather than taking more debt out, in other words, if the rate of credit growth declines, that is then deflationary, that sucks um, effectively value out of the system. And that can then become a reinforcing downward cycle. And so as you move interest rates lower, rather than interest rates leading to inflation, in this theory of the world, it can lead to deflation. And the point there is that once that starts to um, grind through, it's very, very hard to turn it around. Japan is the best example the Eurozone is the best example. The Eurozone has taken interest rates into negative territory, as has Japan, and yet there is no sign of inflation. Now, that's the sort of the, the dilemma that you face. So who's right? Well, if you are a gold bug and if you are somebody who's in the um, asset industry, um, you will want inflation because that creates um, significant momentum, etc., etc. So there are lots of advocates of that model and recommendations off the back of it. If you are a deflationary holder, then you, you, you've got a different view because basically in the deflationary world, the chances are is that even gold is going to not necessarily gain in value. The stock markets will probably slide backwards. And the chances of getting growth in the traditional sense is, is very low. So we get into a stagflationary, deflationary um, cycle. And that's the dilemma. I, I, I'm on, on the fence. I don't know which way this is going to go. But I am less convinced, compared with many people, that actually the future is naturally inflationary. And therefore, I've tended to be more cautious than some investors who are basically piling into inflation protecting assets. Um, I'm preferring to sort of say, mm, not sure yet. Let's see how it plays out. Central banks have been very bad at actually um, bringing inflation in. As you know, the um, inflation metrics at the moment are very low. And even with the Fed saying they want to you know, allow inflation to come over the, um, you know, the barrier a little bit to account of the really low um, momentum they've had in the last few years. Um, they can say that. But if their strategy is continued just to sort of put more liquidity into the system, and if there's no demand for that liquidity, um, then it may flow to asset inflation. So we might see stock markets rise a little ahead. But ultimately, that's not going to drive momentum in the real economy. If you have lack of momentum in the real economy, then this whole thing turns around. So in a nutshell, that's the dilemma that I think we face. And I'm not sure that we know which way this is going to evolve. All I'm saying to people is you want to be careful betting everything on an inflationary future when the leading indicators so far, those have been at it the longest, which is Japan and the Eurozone, 
have created deflation despite doing all the things that we talk about. Now, then the next thing, just to sort of complete the picture, and this is Steve Van Meter's point, if you look carefully at the US situation, the banks essentially are swapping assets. So what they're doing is basically, um, if you think of the structure of their balance sheets, they're actually moving more of the um, Fed debt onto their balance sheets. And, you know, that process is continuing. So that that su supports their structural integrity from a capital perspective. But they are actually repaying other. So the net growth isn't it's it's an asset transfer and that's that's steve's critical point right it's really an asset transfer rather than purely creating new money out of nowhere we've created more money right now the question is where does that money go to if you don't actually enable it ultimately to flow into the banking system and if the banks don't, aren't able to lend it because there's nobody actually wanting to borrow more more loans then that ain't going to work. So therefore, the government might throw it into um, helicopter money, right? It might throw it into infrastructure spending, all of those things. But those activities aren't necessarily inflationary. So, so the question is, what do you do with the money, right? And, and, you know, the MMT guys who are also now, you know, we should think about those, the MMT guys say, well, interest rates are really, really low. They're going to stay low for probably forever. That means that you can actually, um, you know, lift the government debt, and uh, the fact of the matter is that if rates stay low, then the governments can service it. But then the question is, yeah, but what do you do with the money, right? Do you actually pro productively invest it? Do you actually create momentum in the economy? Or, as the bank, uh, as the government here is, I think, doing, just basically throwing a bit of money around the place and hoping somehow that the private sector is going to pick it up and run with it, right? All of the evidence is that corporates are buying back shares by issuing those bonds and buying those bonds and essentially, um, you know, artificially lifting um, their share prices, despite the fact that the performance of those businesses are pretty low at the moment. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, if you look at consumers around the world, it's true in the US, it's true here, they're paying down debt rather than actually taking more debt out. I mean, in Australia, the total credit growth is around 2% and, you know, it's falling slightly despite the fact all those everyone's talking about first time buyers being controlled back into the market and etc cetera, etc cetera. so the question becomes where does the money go right that's the critical question and and the, the the point there is that there is an argument to say at some point if international investors in particular lose faith in what the government is doing then they will not invest unless interest rates go up and of course if interest rates go up, then the cost of that debt starts to uh, um, accelerate dramatically, right? And on the other hand, I guess there's an argument to say if you can get inflation, then the idea is that you can actually effectively in real terms deflate the total balance is outstanding. And of course, there are arguments that that's what they're trying to do. The question is, can they do it? And there's no evidence around the world that they've been successful in doing it. My argument is... If you actually are unsuccessful in, you know, creating the momentum in the economy because the economy is, is significantly broken, and I think that many of those government investments are actually money throwing, you know, bad money after bad money. Um, a lot of the job keeper went to corporates who should never have got it in the first place. A lot of small businesses never, never got any of it, and they're the ones really struggling. About one third of SMEs in my surveys are actually likely to fail in the next year or so. Um, I mean, there are so many, you know, leading indicators of of negativity in the in the economy, but they're going to go on doing that. So they they will, they, you know, the one point one trillion. Well, that's going to be definitely exceeded. It'll be a lot, lot more than that before we finish. But unless they change their tune in terms of where they put that money it doesn't necessarily create the momentum in the economy and i just come back to this worrying statistic right although they're these first-time buyers have been taking first-time buyer loans and trying to buy it into the property market the mortgages uh, of existing loans is being paid down faster so net the overall loan pool is um, going down that's deflationary right um the banks um will not be able to loosen lending standards too much because of they've got to sort of you know bear in mind there are still risks and the risks actually in the economy are very high i've been speaking to a number of bankers who are very concerned about the risks in their portfolios now we're going to see probably more bad news down the track there is no certain path here of the government and the treasury and, and the reserve bank together being able to create 
a, an inflation wave, a momentum of economic recovery wave. And if they're not successful in doing that, then the only other option is, you know, grinding on or grinding down. And remember this, China has now started turning the, um, you know, the volume up in terms of turning off um, various, um, you know, e uh, exports from Australia. Uh, iron ore looks to be the latest. BHP confirmed that the other day. So our trade um, situation is going to deteriorate. We've been a one trick pony there. That's another risk. Um, and the final point I'd make is that this is not something which is just happening here, but it's happening, of course, in a lot of other countries, too, in terms of this same central bank nuttiness of continuing to try and do more and more and more of the same thing, only bigger. Right now, the problem is, if you look at it, actually, you know, from a modeling perspective, you have to actually do not a linear increase, but a logarithmic increase in the amount of um, um, injection of liquidity that you need to just stand still. So the problem is that at some point that, you know, this this can't go on for this can't go indefinitely. Although I've probably gone for a lot longer than people think. Right. I mean, think about the four, four trillion that the US um, has uh, put in. Um, you know, that's what the Fed's done, plus plus everything else. Um, but it's not actually turning the economy around. And, and so my my argument is this is fundamentally broken. The property market is the key to understand, right? And, and, and this is actually the point, right? Because we know that household debt to income ratios are very, very high. We've got some of the highest ratios in the world. Debt to GDP for households is also very high. And it's all to do with housing. 65% of bank lending is housing related plus another 10% for construction related. So three quarters of banking is actually in the, in the housing and construction sector. That, that's, that's a huge deal, right? The problem is that we are not getting anything like the amount of investment in productive businesses and innovative businesses and in creating more value all we're doing is basically inflating house prices because of this debt multiplier that i've mentioned earlier on the fact is that banks can continue to lend for as long as people actually want to borrow now then therefore it comes back to a question of confidence and a question of whether whether the banks are willing and able to borrow well the reserve bank has made it absolutely clear by manipulating the yield curve and providing direct liquidity infusions into the banks that the banks have more than enough money to lend. There is not a supply side problem in Australia in terms of banks and their ability to lend and structurally they are actually pretty sound so there's no issue why they couldn't lend. But they have to, you need demand, right? <clears throat> and demand comes from a few different sources. The property investor sector was a very significant driver of, of, of property for quite some time, but they have actually basically stepped on the sidelines now because rental streams are, are actually um, decreasing rather than increasing for many. And the capital appreciation that we had has pretty much stopped in many places. Now, there are a few exceptions, but if you look at the standard uh, high rise unit property investor, they're losing money from the capital and also on a um, uh, income basis. And in fact, there's about more than half of property investors are in negative um, returns at the moment. So that sector has gone away. We've also got no international investment now for property in Australia. Chinese basically said, no, don't do that. Um, there are as evidence that a number of uh, foreign buyers who committed off the plan and paid their 10% aren't wanting to complete. They just disappear. Very hard to do anything about that. And we also know that migration is going to be negative. So overall supply demand means we have less demand for property than ever we've had. We think that the um, net oversupply of properties now about 1.2 million properties across Australia and that's continuing to increase there's no reason why prices would rise so the only thing that can make prices rise is if the debt machine can be pumped again now that's why first time buyer incentives are there on the table that's why home builders there on the table to try and actually suck people into the, the Ponzi scheme to keep the whole of the property sector going the question is how long will that be able to survive? Bearing in mind, we have a lot of people still paying down mortgages. We've got property investors, as I said, on one side. We've got some up traders who are interested in buying bigger property. But if they believe that property prices are going to slide rather than rise, they're going to wait. And then you've got what I call down traders. These are people sitting in larger properties with equity. And they're now getting to the point of thinking, gee, well, actually, if prices aren't going to continue to rise, maybe I should get out now. And that will be probably more supply coming on next year. So the supply demand disequilibrium that I see is flying in the face of all of the incentives, all of the drivers to try and actually support the banks and support 
the housing and finance sector. I don't know which is going to win. I just know that this is a really interesting tug of war. But I have a nasty suspicion, bearing in mind that prices are 40% over long-term trends relative to all the metrics that I look at. Um, at some point, this is going to come back. And it's a question, I think, of whether it's going to come back slowly, whether it's going to come back quickly. The banks obviously are desperate to lend more. Um, they're chopping their rates to minimum to try and actually encourage new people to come in. They are looking to reduce the lending standards further. But of course, in a higher unemployment environment, they've still got to have those risks in mind. Remember that we've got some people now re re returning their uh, repayments to normal status, but about half haven't yet. And um, unfortunately, quite a few of those, I think, are unlikely to do that. So you've got this real complex situation i have the view still that over the next two or three years prices will be lower than they are today but the government will do absolutely everything and will throw you know lots of liquidity lots of money <coughs> at the property sector and the banks to try and support it because if it fell it would be the biggest crunch ever and that's the dilemma that i see my own view is I think stocks are overvalued. They will come back because the, the, the fundamentals have to come back at some point. But that may take a bit of time. Um, there are, I, was, I, I did an interview with Harry Dent, uh, in fact, yesterday, which is quite a long, ranty interview from him. But he made a wonderful set of points about the fact that um, stock markets will come back at some point. He's got this 90-year cycle and he thinks that, uh, you know, the end of this year, beginning of next year is when that hits. So we'll see. So... At the moment, the uh, over the next little while, I think, still think some of the bonds are actually where the opportunity is because I think that things will continue the way they are going for some some long time, um, and obviously the price of bonds move accordingly. Um, the uh, story with regard to property investment is I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole at the moment. I think that um, the uh, likelihood is that people are going to get significantly burnt. I, all my surveys are showing lots of property investors are now really struggling. About 25% are underwater and the uh, number who are looking to sell over the next few months uh, are quite strong. But the point you've got to ask yourself is, is this going to be a long, slow grind? All right. Or is it going to be effectively bubbling up to a, a significant reset inflection point, right? And do you therefore prepare for the other side of that inflection point when, in fact, values get reset? And it's a bit like the 1929, um, you know, 31 window where effectively uh, a lot of people lost their shirts, but other people who could see a bit more prepared beforehand waited for the fall and then basically reinvested at that point, you know, the Kennedys being a good example. Um, so what I'm trying to do is position ahead of the fall, which I think is coming, but not yet place too many bets, because I actually think that the timing is not clear. Neither is the trajectory completely clear, but I'm just not convinced enough of hyperinflation coming in or even very strong inflation coming in within the sort of time horizon that many people and many experts and many people on YouTube are all talking about. I just don't see it. I just think the central bank strategies have been fundamentally flawed over the last 20 to 30 years. They're repeating the same mistakes again, only more so. And they're expecting a different result. And I frankly don't see why that would be the case. I would think we're going to see the same cycle of more, you know, more infusion of um, liquidity into the system. I, I expect the quantitative easing and the jaw boning in particular will go up even to fever pitch and beyond. I mean, the, the Fed at the moment is spending more time trying to talk the markets in a particular direction rather than doing much, which is interesting. And a bit the same now in Australia. Um, I think they're out of am ammo and I think they're out of strategy. And the, uh, what I suspect will happen is they'll have to actually break the mould and think more unconventionally, whether that's a digital currency of some sort or whether it's um, you know, deeply negative interest rates or something like that, to, that, which they'll probably try. But I'm not sure that it will necessarily actually take it to where people expect to take it, it to be. And if, in fact, we don't get inflation, then a lot of the investment strategies that people are holding at the moment are actually going to look very, very um, bad down the track. So all I'm saying is <clears throat> at least consider the alternatives, right? At least understand that there is potentially an inflationary future, but there is also a deflationary future. And therefore, because the signs are so conflicting and it could go one of two ways, just be a bit cautious. Don't put all your eggs in the inflationary basket, assuming that somehow 
this is all going to you know work out and i'd also make the other point this government debt that we've got this massive amount of government debt will have to be paid back ultimately in some way at some time in the future and that is a deeply de deflationary force later right so whatever we do in the short term we've still got that debt a bomb to come later so um i just can't get away from understanding the quantum of the debt we've got which is growing the lack of momentum in terms of economic growth which is definitely still stagnant and the levers that the central banks are pulling don't seem to me to be connected to much we know that people are consuming less rather than more at the moment if you look at the consumption numbers they're way down the gdp of course is half related to consumer consumption that's significantly down now there are some consumers who are still consuming well they've still got jobs and they're doing fine but what i'm concerned about is the larger proportion of the population who are under deep financial pressure are um, finding that their jobs are now part-time jobs they're getting paid less there's no there's no income growth uh, or you know even the reserve bank is saying that income was going to be pretty static over the next three years and for many people there's been no income growth since 2010 right just bear that in mind so a lot of people are under deep financial pressure and therefore their ability to consume is crippled all right so that's the first point so overall demand i think will be less rather than more ahead the second point is if you look at it in inflation adjusted terms the public sectors have seen a small increase the private sector has seen a decrease but there are more people in the private sector than the public sector so overall net income growth has been static since about 2012 all right so that means that people have less money available but they also have more debt now What's happening at the moment is that the average repayments on loans that people have are roughly in line where they were back in 2010, 2011, when interest rates were a lot higher and when effectively income had been growing. But they're, they're still committed to that, that chunk of debt. But many people now, because of the fact that they've got less income coming in, are having to actually borrow more, look at afterpay, look at some of the other um, you know, quasi-financial products that are all going quite hot at the moment. That's because people are struggling with, to maintain their lifestyles. The third point to make is what's different now is we're starting to see what I call structural unemployment. So the first wave post-COVID were part-time workers and gig workers all being laid off, right? But now I'm seeing middle managers and above in large companies suddenly being asked to leave because basically companies are having to right size and that has only just started uh, you know look in consulting started very early financial services are doing some stuff other sectors are, are following too as you may know retail has had a, a real issue as well um, so there are many more people now out of work and a lot of the out of work people now have been on big incomes and were the very people who were consuming a lot so I am a little bit less certain of the ability of household sectors to consume more ahead. And if that is true, it goes back to my deflation inflation story, right? Because if it is true, then effectively that momentum that you're talking about may not, may not be there. Bear in mind also, of course, that the, the dollar is now up at, what, 71, 72. And that has an impact in terms of you know, prices of imports versus exports, that may have a negative impact too. We might actually end up being in, in, importing deflation rather than inflation, right? Because people were thinking the dollar was going to be about 50. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not necessarily seeing the conditions where you actually have more spending power and therefore you can drive prices up. And in fact, if you talk to most retailers, they're having to eat margin at the moment maybe other than office furniture and, um, you know, those uh, doing remote uh, uh, communications uh, setups and things like that. The, the only other point I'd make is that, interestingly, the construction sector are now paying their um, workers less, but they're actually having to pay more for all the materials to actually build the houses that we don't need anymore, right? So what we're seeing there is that the mix of costs in a construction job is changing. And, and productivity more broadly is probably one of the most critical things to talk about, right? Our productivity stinks, right? We have, we, we, we have gone backwards and, and frankly, um, there's no processes there to turn it around. You know, all the argument about, well, the technology will, you know, enable us to be more effective and productive. It's proved not to be true. Um, and, and so productivity, innovation, 
new businesses investing in new things all very very much um, um, you know uh, on the back burner at the moment and I'm speaking to a number of small businesses who can't get funding who can't actually get the um, help to innovate and, and create new businesses currently now um, so the small business sector is definitely cooked in my view the large business community right okay well the financial services sector we know are being very much compressed despite the fact they've been giving all this liquidity and you know i'd argue a lot of the budget was about bank saving rather than anything else frankly but you know that's <laughs> then you've got the the you've got the resource sector well you know the bhp story from yesterday which is that they've confirmed that uh, china's turned off some of their um um demand for iron ore that's a that's a big that's a big move right so we've got the china factor going on there we've got the covid thing which is still raging the international borders are unlikely to open anytime soon that means that we're not going to get a lot of um tourism coming back to australia that means that a lot of international students won't come back um so you can look at big sectors of the economy and you can understand why they potentially will be under pressure so my question is where is that countervailing force that's going to create the momentum to allow people to consume more to create the inflation i just can't see it um this isn't going to necessarily you know blow up this october i mean i'm not sure harry's right in terms of his timing we, we shall see could well but this could go on for quite some time the, the central banks will go on doing what they're currently doing but you know the definition of insanity is to comp do the same thing again only more so and expect a different outcome right the the the, the central banking philosophy that is driving this at the moment is bankrupt in my view it's not going to get us to where we need to get to right but unless we can actually change that uh, philosophy we're going to go on through this process for quite a lot longer and, and it's interesting that there were some reports out of europe that said you realize that banks basically as interest rates come down get less profit so they actually struggle to be able to maintain themselves. They tend to take higher, more speculative risks rather than lending, because essentially the only way is to, to trade stuff to try and actually, um, uh, you know, make some make some returns. They can't take deposit rates below a certain level because people just take the money out of the banking system, and that then creates a bigger problem. Um, and it's very hard to turn the, the whole process around. So once rates are very low, they tend to get stuck there because there's no way back. And that's my real big concern, that this central bank strategy and these very low rates take us to a cul-de-sac, and I can't see a way out of the cul-de-sac at the moment. And that's why I'm sort of sitting where I'm sitting, saying, this ain't working, it ain't gonna work. The future is obviously quite concerning. Um, it might be inflationary, but I have a feeling it's more likely to be deflationary. And there is a significant risk of a financial correction through this process if you look at the rate of the rate of credit growth it's declining so you have to look at two things you have to look at the reserve bank credit aggregates that comes out each month and that's broken down by different categories and then you need to look at the new loans which are committed loans which the abs publish a few a few days later that's commitments that's not the same as drawn down loans right so so what rba reports and what APRA reports is the total gross balances for for housing and for business held by the banking system right the new committed facilities which is going up for first time buyers and you know new new construction doesn't tell you about loan repayments it doesn't tell you about the refinanced situation so you have to look at that and then you also have to look at the APRA statistics that gives us the loans that are actually not currently being repaid and those have come down a little bit on repayment holidays about half are coming back according to the ABA today um, but we know that there's a there's a, a, a sort of a crunch coming for a number of people who income has dissipated and are now unable basically to make those loan repayments again so that's the other factor so you've got to understand housing in the context of debt you can't you know separate the two because this debt engine is broken and i think it's unlikely that we're going to see massive expansion of debt anytime soon that's another deflationary force that i come back to so there you have it i'm afraid that we are in a complex situation with lots of variables i think that those who actually are claiming to know precisely how this is going to play out are probably confused and myopic there are too many unvariables, too many uncertainties. So be cautious, 
and be careful at the moment. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.